thank you very much. I would like to start by telling you uh, about a, an event, an unusual event that took place since last uh, symposium, the Mad One symposium. It took place uh, in a kindergarten north of Copenhagen, a kindergarten uh, known as Skobo, which is Danish for living in the forest, a kindergarten where the kids are out in the forest most of the day. Uh, and this kindergarten was interesting because we had a visitor here in April, in the spring, a speaker from, from Matt, the Mad One Symposium, uh, Miles Irving from England, uh, a renowned forester uh, who was here to forest with the Noma chefs uh, and bringing along his family, including a three-year-old uh, girl. Uh, I suggested, why don't you come to my daughter's uh, kindergarten uh, and tell the kids about foraging because that way your girl would have a little fun uh, in a week dominated by adults talking about food. So Miles uh, came to this kindergarten uh, for, a, for a day uh, showing the kids uh, around uh, the area uh, up in Dyrhavn, a forest-like park north of Copenhagen, three, time, three times the size of the Central Park uh, in New York, a huge and very popular place with a lot of different uh, vegetation uh, and two, more than 2,000 deers uh, living there. Uh, and in this area, he took out these 20 kids uh, to show them what is there that is edible. Only tiny plants because the deer has been there already, uh, but there, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And he would pick up stuff, he would show the stuff to, to the kids, and in a sense, to an adult like myself, at some kind of intellectual level, there was, well, I, I knew something, of course, nothing like what Miles does. I knew something about uh, wild, wild vegetation. I knew there was a lot of edible stuff out there. Uh, but seeing it through the eyes of these three, four, five, six-year-old kids, and seeing their surprise when their day-to-day -day playground turned out, as one of them said, to be actually a battery of food. To see the transformation in the eyes of these kids uh, of something that was a nice and pleasant uh, area to play around, uh, becoming suddenly something that you could eat, where you can go and search stuff and find stuff all the time. That was a truly uh, emotional, very, a very strongly uh, changing experience for me. It opened my eyes to the very simple fact that at some intellectual level was well known to me that the world is full of food. There's more food than we uh, usually think of, and we have as a culture, as a civilization, forgotten how much food is out there. But to see that through the eyes of these more or less happy kids was really an eye-opener to me. So that evening, after being there and having this fantastic uh, sudden understanding of the richness of the world, I went back and said, what was so surprising here? What was it that, that moved me so much emotionally? And I wrote down three simple lines uh, to explain to myself what I had experienced during that day. And these, these three lines, I'll, I'll try to, to explain to you what, what they mean. They seem a little weird. Uh, everything is everywhere, and go look and eat together. Now, uh, the first one, everything is everywhere, would seem like a somewhat grandiose statement. Uh, if you say that everything is everywhere, you've basically said nothing. Uh, so you would say, isn't, isn't that a bit far to go? But my point here is that this is really the first approximation, as a physicist would say, our first approach, our first take on the problem here, what is, in fact, in the world, the situation. It's the situation that there's everywhere in the world something to be found that you could eat, or is, this, or is it rather that there's nothing in the world you could eat? Uh, and the point is that the first approximation, the first take on what kind of world we live in is through the eyes of these kindergarten kids to say, well, actually, the world is edible. And everywhere you look, if you have the skills of miles, which I do not, you can find something that's edible. Also, sometimes something that's po poisonous, but you will find everywhere something. And in a way, it's a better first approach to the world to say that there's everywhere everything than to say the opposite, which was what I was brought up with when I went to uh, kindergarten 250 years ago. Uh, it was more like 
there's nothing in the world. The world is basically a desert of asphalt and concrete and stones and the odd lawn, but that, that, doesn't, that isn't really edible. You stand on it and give lectures. It's not something you could eat. So the world was like devoid of food. And food was something you would find in a plastic tray wrapped in cellophane in, in these supermarkets that you would drive through in your car in the suburbs. So the world was basically no food, no fun, and a, a few depots of food to be found somewhere. Uh, and that's another first approximation, the world is empty. Uh, of course, the truth is in between, but first approximations are very good in the sense, is it day or is it night? Is it raining or is it sunshine? And then you can take in all the nuances of what time of day and what time of night and so on. But the first approximation that I was brought up with was the world is dead. And what I see through the eyes of these kindergarten kids is that the world is alive. In the old world, world food was something that you got out of a plastic tray in the supermarket. Water was something coming from pipes. And that was very nice to have water, but the idea that water would actually flow through the environment was, was very uh, strange to, to me at that time. <clears throat> and it seems it's still very strange to urban planners who are totally unprepared for the fact that water will stream through the environment uh, when it rains and that this water has to go somewhere, that we are part of a flow. And also, energy was something I was brought up with as a very rare thing that you would have to go a, a far way to find. And you would find it in depots like oil or, uh, or gas that you would find in, uh, in the Middle East or maybe in the North Sea. But it was far and distant and it took a lot of money and a lot of power to, to, to get it to, uh, to use. So energy was also something that you would never find in the environment unless you were very rich and very clever and had a lot of technology. That's the old world, that's the world I was brought up in. The real world, the one I live in, is really a world where there is food everywhere. You, you can discuss whether there's enough food everywhere and so on, but you cannot discuss the fact that nature will grow edible stuff even if you turn your back on it. Food and edible stuff is not something odd. In a few spots, it's something everywhere in the world. Water is flowing everywhere in the world and we just need to to, to help it flow the right way. And energy is everywhere. We've learned that from renewable energy. There's wind, there's sun, there's lots of energy. Only we have not built the machines to catch it. But now we are becoming a little more clever and, and waking up to the fact that, in fact, our environment is full of uh, energy and we just have to uh, reach out and grab it uh, and, and take care of it until we need it. So the real world is a world of abundance. The real world is not a world of deserts. And this very, very simple understanding that we are part of a huge flow of life, energy, and information uh, on this planet, and there's plenty if we only uh, become clever enough to reach out for it, uh, and the world is not a desert filled with depots. This is a very simple understanding, and you may ask, uh, why didn't we know that all along? Why was I brought up in a world uh, that seemed to be uh, dominated by scarcity and, and desert-like structures. Uh, why didn't we uh, go look for it? Because we didn't. We didn't go look. Uh, there was perhaps the elderflowers or a few things you could eat, and that was sort of an oddity uh, in my childhood that there were things that you could actually eat out there in nature. Uh, I didn't reflect very much about where the food came from, but, but eating stuff sort of right off the trees or something was, was weird. So we didn't look if there was uh, food out there. We didn't look if there was energy out there because all the money went into the nuclear power plants and the coal, coal mines and whatever. And nobody cared really about doing science and technology to, to develop solar panels and windmills and so on. So we didn't look at all. And, and you could ask, why didn't we look? And that, that is a, 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 an old story and a sad story and a story that has partly been told uh, uh, at this symposium. Uh, already uh, last year, the fact that we saw that the world was an unfriendly place. It was a desert that was unkind to us. It was not a nice place for us to be. It was a hostile place for us to be. And because we thought of that, we thought we had to control the world. We had to take command of the world to actually survive because it wasn't in itself generous. It wasn't offering stuff in itself. We had to go there and make sure that there was the stuff that we needed. 
Um, and in short, the story starts actually 10,000 years ago when we made a transition as a species from having been hunter-gatherers for most of human existence, uh, living off the food that grew all by itself in nature in form of vegetation and animals. We were living, uh, so to speak, on what was offered to us. Uh, and then we became farmers. We, uh, we, we wanted to control the plants and the animals around us so that we were sure we would have something edible. And when you study this transition, uh, historically, and is also a, a, as it has happened in modern times, there's a huge reduction in the diversity of food available to uh, hunter-gatherers uh, when they become farmers. Hunter-gatherers live off a wide uh, diversity of plants and animals, uh, but the uh, farmers only base themselves on very few fish, very few animals, and very few uh, plants. Uh, basically, the, the vector, the movement was from living off the wild, which has its own will and is there for its own reason, uh, to live rather on the tame, that which we control and dominate uh, and have domesticated, brought into our house uh, in the form of cultivated plants and, and animals that have been tamed and domesticated. Now, this, as, as uh, was already referred to uh, by John, means that 60% of, uh, of what we eat, of the calories we get, come from only four crops, uh, a very poor and a very limited existence. And this, of course, also has a direct consequence for gastronomy, for food making, because all the wonderfully skilled and, and, and clever cooks of this world uh, are using all their energy to try to make some very few and very dull uh, products uh, edible day after day after day. When we only basically eat like four crops, it takes a lot of cleverness to make people feel happy about having potatoes uh, every day all around the year. So there are, are many different uh, recipes for potatoes and, and the chefs will compete on who can make the most novel kind of potato. But, but the sad thing, of course, is that these skills are made basically to make uh, very dull things seem interesting. Uh, and that's, that's a sad waste of chefs, I'd say. And I think it's that this is an overstatement that all of gastronomy, but much of gastronomy has been about making something very poor seem rich, rather than going out there where all the rich stuff grows all by itself. But ironically, this, this weird idea that the world was a desert that we had to control to get something to eat, that was a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that the world did, in fact, become a desert. Uh, this map uh, shows where agriculture uh, originated in, in the red areas uh, and where it is uh, most dominant today in the, in the yellow areas. And you'll notice that many of the places where agriculture arose were actually uh, areas that today uh, are deserts. And there's a reason for this, and the reason is agriculture. Agriculture ruined the soil, so what was left was deserts like in the Middle East, where people now fight over hopeless lack of resources because they ruined the whole stuff uh, thousands of years ago. So this means that it actually did become a desert, uh, and we did indeed lose faith in the generosity of the planet. We did lose faith in what was offered to us, so we started to control everything. We lost our way as, as natural uh, inhabitants of this planet and started to want to change the face of the planet to get something to eat. Now, what we forgot was that we actually live in a very kind garden. We live in a place that is actually very nice. So this brings me back to my kindergarten rules, uh, where, as you uh, may remember, the second rule was that uh, when we know that everything is everywhere, uh, or we claim that as our first approximation, the next thing we should do, of course, is go look and, and see what is there. Um, and here's Miles uh, and his wife going looking in Dürerhaven, north of Copenhagen, to see if there's something there. Uh, and, of course, the point is that if you go look, there is a lot of stuff. There's plenty of offerings out there in, in nature, and if you look in, inwards, you will know, of course, that inside of you there's plenty of needs. Uh, there's, you need something to eat. You need something to survive. Uh, and so when you have a lot outside and you have uh, also uh, all these stuff, you need to bridge it. And the bridge, of course, is appetite. Appetite is the urge to reach out to get something from the world outside 
and to bring it in there so that you'll, you'll feel better, you'll feel happy, you'll survive. Appetite is, is that thing that drives us out into the environment to pick stuff. Uh, and for some reason, we have cultivated this appetite in such a style that we only want to have stuff that we control. Uh, uh, but we can, we, can, we can start another tradition which is in fact a very old hunter-gatherer tradition that we trust the world, that we search the world for good stuff. We have skills and we go out there and we are careful to, to, to pick things and we do it in a clever way so we don't uh, ruin the world, that we trust our senses, we trust our appetite, we trust our taste, we learn how to do it and we go out there and we get stuff. That's difficult to learn. Uh, we need people who can train us because we've lost this knowledge, but of course we can. And we need to dare to go out there and taste things, and we need to be clever in the way we do it so we don't taste things that are known to be poisonous, of course, but we need to trust the world. We need to dare go out and seek food. We need to take care of the world and to, to care about what we can find out there, and we need to share what we have when we come back. And this dare, care, and share thing is all about reaching out to the world through our appetite. Now this share thing uh, is, is about something else that we have forgotten, which is linked to the kindness of the world, and that is the kindness of ourselves, of our, our tendency to share stuff with each other. Uh, and again, we have a kindergarten rule here saying that we should eat together. Eating together, as, as we all know, is, 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 a very, is a very satisfying and fulfilling activity. Eating together is better than eating alone, uh, and you like to sit there uh, and, and eat stuff. Uh, you like to share stuff. You like to share knowledge about what is in the world. So you go foraging, you go hunting, you go out searching stuff, you go out growing your produce, you go out and do all that, and you come back to your family and your friends, and you share it. And that's, that's when it really gives meaning to you what you do. And the more you share and the more you care about the things you you pick uh, from the wild or, or things you grow uh, in, in your garden, the more you care about that, the more you get, and the happier you become, and, and the more you share that with other people, the more happiness you find. Now, it's important to recognize that we are, in a sense, akin to the garden, to the world we live in. Akin comes from the word kin. Kin is about family relationships, kinship, uh, akin being off the same kind or, uh, or family related to the world, and we are in fact family related to the world. The world passes through us all the time. Uh, a recent, uh, a recent uh, way of, of, of studying the matter flows through, through human beings uh, has shown that if you take all the matter flowing through a person like me or you in the course of a year, including the air we inhale and exhale again, the food we eat, the, the water we drink and so on, it, it adds up to six tons of matter through a year. That's a lot. Uh, the amount of, of, uh, of food and, uh, and drink is, is on the order of 1.5 ton, and the amount of, of air we take in and breathe out again uh, is, is somewhat higher. But this is an enormous amount of matter going through each of us every year. Uh, and most of the atoms in us are replaced in the course of, it, of the year, so we are more like an eddy or a pattern in, in a flow of matter going through, through us, then we are actually stable things like a table. So the flow aspect of us is that we are really part of the world, we are really part of this enormous flow, and of course there is some kind of identity and stability in us, and, and we can remember our childhood, but the childhood, uh, when we went to kindergarten, uh, we, were, we were made up of entirely different atoms th than we are today. There's basically almost no atoms left from when we were, went to kindergarten, but of course we still have some memories of that time, we still have the identity of that time, so we are a pattern in a flow. Uh, I like to show this ecosphere, a simple little glass bowl, where you have uh, shrimps swimming around, uh, even though the system is closed, but they can do so because daylight enters it, and the little shrimps will make waste that bacteria will break down into nutrients that algae, sort of plant-like structures, can use uh, to uh, collect energy from the, from the daylight and produce food and oxygen that the shrimps will take in. And this is very similar to what's happening in the somewhat bigger bowel, the earth, where you have the plants uh, that 
suck up energy from the sun, provide food and oxygen for the animals who run around and give lectures and do other silly mad stuff, uh, make waste that the bacteria will, will break down into uh, fertilizer for the plants and so on. All the atoms are going around all the time, uh, one time plant, another time animal, another time bacteria. It's a closed material flow uh, powered by the energy from the sun. Now it follows from this that plants need animals. You cannot have plants in, in the present form without having animals who do their job in collecting the plants again, eating them and shedding them out as fertilizer. Uh, and that also means that the planet actually needs us. Uh, I've, I've been brought up in a time where we we've sort of felt an excuse for being here. Sorry we're here, sorry we're consuming stuff. But the, it, the planet needs us and it particularly needs our shit and, and our farting uh, for regulating many different things. Uh, so we belong here, we are natives on this planet. It's not a mistake that we're here, we are not aliens from a spaceship. We are part of this ecology. Uh, but we forgot that, and nobody told the new natives, the kids uh, that, 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 that come, nobody told them that you're, you, it's, it's, it's a good idea that you're here, you're welcome here, and the world is generous to you because what you need is, is in the world. Uh, we tend to forget that, and that's a bad thing because we must always remember that the most important thing we know about anything is a very simple fact that we are here. The very simple fact that we are here and alive is a very important fact because it tells us a lot that our kind of beings are here. What it tells us is that we are all, each of us in this room, are the last part of a chain, an unbroken chain of survival in the sense that your parents survived long enough to have you and your grandparents long enough to have your parents and before that, uh, uh, you, people uh, gave birth to people, and before that, some apes gave uh, birth to apes, and before that, some slime molds gave birth to slime molds or whatever they did. Uh, so there's an unbroken chain of being alive going billions of years back. And each of us, without any guarantees for anything, uh, have this ability uh, inherit, inherited that somehow we are, uh, we are children of somebody who made it. Our ancestors made it, and we can make it. There's no, there's no guarantee, there's no, there's no security here, but there's just the knowledge, the self-confidence that we are out of an unbroken chain of survivors. So the very fact that we are here shows us a lot of, uh, about it. And, and of course, basically, we are here because they, our ancestors, had appetite. Imagine an animal that has no appetite and no curiosity about the environment. That animal would be dead very quickly. Of course, it also has to control its appetite or it would also become uh, too obese and, and, and be eaten too easily by the predators. But, but appetite is crucial. If there was no appetite, uh, they wouldn't be here, our ancestors, and we wouldn't be here. So it's, it's our reaching out into the environment, our curiosity about the environment that makes us uh, uh, that makes, us, uh, makes it possible for us to be here. And what we need to understand now at this stage in human history is that we need our appetite for planet Earth, we need our curiosity and our wanting to go out there and, and get stuff from planet Earth. And we are the generation, we are the, the part of history that has to make this huge change from being afraid and scared of the world to uh, actually uh, try, uh, having the courage to go out in the world. We shouldn't have a strategy of controlling depots in a desert like I was brought up with. We should have a strategy of exploring the richness of the garden, of the world in which we live. We have to make, in a sense, the greatest change of direction in 10,000 years. In 10,000 years, we've been going away from the wild, taming and insisting on taming everything. And now we have to go in the direction, uh, uh, not away from the wild, but, but back into the wild, not living only on, on the wild, but we have to change the direction. And this will be indeed a milestone in evolution of life on Earth, because we are part of this species, which is so dominant and so noisy. And if we change our strategy from dominating everything to, uh, to liking everything, to feeling at home with everything, it's a huge change, a milestone in evolution of life on Earth. And the cutting edge, the very, very cutting edge of this change in evolution, the change that's about to happen, 
the cutting edge, cutting edge of all this is those who know about taste, know about appetite, know about reaching out for the world for edible stuff. So the cutting edge of this huge change in evolution is the, all the chefs with their sharp knives. And it's a great, it's a great fact that we live in this, in, in the, at this moment in human history where we discover a very simple fact that this is indeed a kind, kind of world offering us many beautiful things. We shouldn't be afraid of it, we should like it. But of course we are also a part of the world, so my take home message is very simple. It's a kind world and we are part of it, so we have to be kind and not only to the kids. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you Tor, and thank you for being such an appreciative audience. Uh, I love that f sentence, this is a kind, kind of world. Uh, Tor was very good, he only overran by two minutes, which means we've got five minutes left for questions from the audience, and if you put your hand up, there are some people who will get to you with a microphone. So, uh, who would like to be the first person to ask a question? At MAD 2012, there's no prizes, but we would love some questions. Have we got somebody? There must be at least one question in the audience. Yes, we've got a question. Fantastic. My question is whether there's an end to appetite. Is anyone ever sated? An end to appetite? You mean, are you full at some stage? Well, are, are you full? Are we full as a culture ever? Or does appetite, is there a finiteness to, and, and will we know? I, it, it seems we have had a voracious appetite for certain things and they've led us into some problems. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about the end of appetite, if there is one. That's a very, that's a very good question. Uh, that I would, I, I would answer this way. In practical terms, no, I think not. I think that the world is, is infinite in, in, in all directions in the sense that it will take very, very long time before we have explored all the possibilities in the world. There are so many things we've chosen not to do that we could try out to do that for many, many, many generations we will still explore this planet and the richness it has. So in that sense, I think not, and I think we will continue to play around with food and, 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 and make it delicious in new ways. So. I think for any practical uh, purpose, there's no end to appetite. Okay, do we have another question from the audience? We do up here. And Rene not only put the symposium together, but he's running around with the microphone, a man for all seasons. Good morning, Tor, and thank you for that. Uh, can I, when does appetite become greed? Excuse me? When, if ever, does appetite become greed? When appetite becomes greed, um, the short, the short answer I would offer would be that when that which tries to satisfy the appetite is not really satisfying, in the sense that if you have a strong appetite and you need stuff to live on, and you're, all you're offered are uh, burgers in, in, in a burger outlet, you'll have to eat a lot of burgers to find those fatty acids you really need, uh, or, 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 or that substance you really need for your body to function. So greed arises out of, of the the poverty of, of the food we eat. Like the, the conquering of the world in the Renaissance was really about going out to find some spice to spice up those silly four crops that we eat uh, uh, because we needed that from India to survive uh, being European peasants. So greed comes from poverty of the input you take in. Okay, we actually do have room for one, well, one more question. Anyone has got a question? Great. Um, thank you for that. It's a very empowering way of thinking of sustainability. Um, the question I have is, education in culinary arts is about making those four starches interesting. What needs to happen to education to change the way that we think about food? 
Excuse me, I'm sorry. What needs to happen in education and training around chefs to change the way we think about food? Well, we, we need to open up again. We need to, to understand at an emotional and intellectual level that the world is very rich. And of course, this happens in the kindergarten and in the cooking schools. And there's a huge, uh, there's a huge task before us. And I think that René and his friends have, have started a process which is of Im immense importance, not only to what we eat, but also to the way we go about environmental issues, the way we go about sustainability, the way we go about quality of life. And I think the driving force, the, the motor behind the new environmental uh, understanding, the new wave of en environmental responsibility that we'll see also in education, the motor behind that is appetite, taste, deliciousness, quality of life. And that is a new take on the, on the environment. It's not about, excuse me, I'll use less. I'm sorry I'm here, but I almost didn't turn on the light. It's going to be very different. I'm proud I'm here and give me some real good food and I'll give you back some real good shit. And that's another take on the environment.